My name is Adit and I'm in post high school and slash UT. And I would like to talk about turmeric. And I would just want to ask if you guys know what um, the curry is made and it's been brought as a yellow color. And it is actually turmeric. So I'll be talking about the healing power of turmeric and what is turmeric as well as the benefits of turmeric and other uses of turmeric. For example, it is also used in Indian culture and also used as in Indian medicine as Ayurveda. So let's begin. Uh, turmeric is a bright yellow color which is been belonging in a ginger family and it is mostly used in food as well as uh, Indian traditions. And turmeric is also called as uh, haldi which is also known as in Hindi and we also say it in Gujarati. So these are the, some benefits of turmeric. First, um, turmeric can be used to release pain and uh, help in reducing infections. And this is an, a true example I was told by Nurse Claire that um, there was a student that he had an injury and then she, uh, the student went to the nurse and the nurse told the student what's the yellow color and the students say that it's turmeric and it's used to reduce pain and help in uh, releasing the pain. The next one is uh, turmeric can be used, it's mostly used as in COVID-19, but it's not been proved by any scientist, but most of the home remedies, they've discovered that it treats COVID. As well as it's mostly used in treating uh, diabetes, Heart, uh, heart diseases as well as obesity. So the first uh, uses of turmeric is used in Indian tradition. For example, the, we use uh, turmeric in uh, serving to our God as we believe that when we serve turmeric, we provide them, we get blessings from our God. And from our picture here above, uh, the yellow part is the turmeric as well as there is a sandalwood and kanku. And the other uses of turmeric, the uses of turmeric can be used in wedding ceremonies. As you see here, uh, a lady and is mostly used in, uh, by the broom and bride, where all family members uh, come together and celebrate and apply haldi pest on the face of the broom and the bride. And we believe that by doing that, uh, the soul of the bride and the broom, before they start their marriage, becomes pure and also it makes the skin go looks good. The other uses of uh, turmeric is being used in uh, uh, Indian tradition is to apply tilak. So tilak is a small dot which is placed on the forehead and it be we believe by doing that uh, it gives us focus and makes our brain work properly and it can be used by anyone, either elders, young students, young child, family members. And this is an example of Sadhu who has done a tilak on his forehead. And also we have, we celebrate Mahasankranti, which is a festival occurs on every 14th of January. And Mahasankranti means that we plant a turmeric in front of our house but in this generation, we live in an apartment. So it doesn't matter, we ju you can just grow turmeric in a pot and then celebrate Mahasankranti. So the next uh, is the uses of turmeric in medicine or other word is called Ayurveda. So in past generations, uh, our ancestors used to uh, use in medicine by making a lot of uh, home remedy stuff and cure uh, uh, medicines. So these are some examples of medicines which is used to treat. For example, anemia, dental problems and diabetes, but there are a lot of uh, diseases can be cured by turmeric. And this is my uh, review. And thank you very much. And I hope everyone liked my presentation. Thank you.
morning everyone i hope uh, you all are doing well so today i am presenting on the topic transforming uh, regular healthcare systems so what basically uh, let's have a background of the topic uh, since the arrival of the pandemic from the march 2020 uh, people are restricted to the homes isolating and quarantining uh, 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 in the rooms like uh, air travel is also restricted due to the covid 19 However, uh, it's been two years, and people are used to uh, this, and people are now started working from home, and they are also uh, learning online. So, healthcare also needs to be digitalized. Digitalized. That's my topic for today. So, what basically is e-health? E-e-e-health is a system by which uh, patients uh, do not need to go to the hospitals. They can. Uh, just directly uh, message or have a uh, voicemail vo- voice call with the doctors so how it basically works is uh, uh patients can directly uh, like we do in a whatsapp chat or in the emails they can put directly their what their problem is in the in that chat and and uh, directly uh, seek for any diagnosis and problem from the doctor so uh, how uh, it works is we can have patient portal uh, virtual appointments in mode monitoring doctor talking to the doctors personal health records uh, personal health apps so uh, at the uh, patient level we can have uh, own personal personal health apps like you can have uh, personal uh, health app of your own and we can uh, just manage how uh, that app will look like like uh, we have a student portal right uh, we also uh, book the tutors uh, from the our college website same goes with this we book the doctors uh, on the basis uh, of what problem do we have what specialist uh, we need for the uh, for the for our treatment and same goes with the healthcare it's it's quite as simple as that so these are the terms uh, which come un- which come under the digital health but uh, th- that's not all this we have uh, more uh, opportunities opportunities coming which uh, uh, digital health proposes for us So first comes the telemedicine. So what basically means the telemedicine and what uh, what's the difference between the telehealth and the telemedicine? Tele telemedicine refers to the term for all the clinical trials we do in the hospital uh, and telehealth uh, refers uh, to a more broader term. Like uh, tele telehealth also refers uh, if we need uh, to uh, uh, consult any uh, doctor by just sitting at the home not just for the uh, uh, diseases just for the diagnosis uh how diagnosis can be done in the digital health is we can have artificial and uh, uh, machine learning uh, in the systems like if i give an example uh if my laptop is has a problem uh, there are uh, there are shortage of uh, customer service agents so how do it, does it work is we type the problem uh, in the system and uh, by artificial and uh, machine learning the system going to diagnose your problem and also uh, uh, give the solution for it so basically we do not need uh, doctors for any short problems or acute diseases next is uh, how it going to work like our student portal or uh, as i said before the uh, how we book the tutor on our college website we have a patient app and a doctor app and admin panel and analytics so doctor need, needs to have a different information in in his or her app like for a ent specialist he ha- he does not he doesn't care about any of the problems in the stomach in the intestine he only cares about the problem uh, which occurs in the ears nose and tongue same goes with the patient patient does not need to have all the information all the medical information uh, need to cure his or her problems so by the uh, by technology we can design patient app and doctor can design his own her app it's quite as simple as designing websites as we do it today so uh, on the patient app uh, like we book a tutor uh, on the college website we just sign up uh, review and select doctor book an appointment and at the end to the payment method and just review the doctor these all things uh, uh, would be in the patient app it's an end to end basis from the birth of a child to the death of a man all things would be covered in this app and from all the qualifications all the information about the personal information of the doctor would be covered in this so here goes the example of a pregnant woman how a pregnant lady does not uh, need to call 911 and go to the hospital and just 
uh, automatically uh, their system generates uh, emergency call to the staff and it comes without an, without any call so what basically this picture shows is there's a belt over her stomach over her abdomen and there's a wrist on her uh, arm too so they whenever the blood pressure increasing increases in her in, in her arm the system uh, with, with the with the bluetooth we can can uh, update in the system that she is having a problem and with the with the, with the help the, that same uh, problem going to be recorded in the database and emergency staff going to help it so there's no need no need to basically panic at the home if the lady is alone at home so why is telehealth ben beneficial what why why do we need it today people are only uh, uh, people have you are used to study online work from home and there's a lot of bur burden to travel to the hospitals for all the surgeries and for all the uh, uh, diseases they have at home so why why don't we have telehealth at home it will help people it will help more and more people and as we as the time passes uh, it will get more and more better secondly it's environment friendly there uh, the people will is uh, this will help uh, in redu reducing the carbon footprint of the people people do not uh, uh, need to uh, uh, put their gas in the cars they can just invest in their uh, mobile phone and a stable internet secondly uh, what we can say is in the poor uh, countries like uh, countries without with, with, which do not have strong in economies like india or other south asian countries or south african countries they do not have a proper healthcare system what they can do is they can uh, have a digital uh, uh, app in their phone and they can connect over the uh, doctors sitting uh, on the other part of the globe so what uh, technology can we use, can we use in the telemedicine apps secure file transfers as the word say uh, whenever uh, we record an information in a database it would be secure it can't be shared with anyone cloud data storage uh, helps us to uh, uh, save our save our files with the help of internet so it can be accessed over any device big data analytic analytics uh, uh, sh uh, helps us to analyze our uh, health how our metrics show how our weight increases over time like if we take the example of a uh, pregnant lady uh, however how her weight uh, increases over time she can analyze from it and same goes with the hippa and high tech so it helps to uh, have a secure uh, transfer of files without uh, uh, having any data breach this is the comparison we can take of uh, what telemedicine and in person doctors have what are the pros and cons of it and uh, what are the costs telemedicine telemedicine is relatively easy than the uh, in person doctors uh, and it has more pro pros in comparison to the in person doctors telehealth also proposes uh, computer assisted, assisted surgery once people have uh, implemented uh, telehealth in their lives they can also do computer assisted uh, computer assisted surgery uh, it is quite expensive these days but i'm sure with the help of the time uh, with the with the with time uh, they gonna uh, it going to be cheaper but uh, now comes the challenges security and data breaches education of the undergraduate and in the medica medical care senior citizens and behavior of the people that's it thank you Thank you for coming on this presentation. My name is Nikita, and today my topic is the new hydrogen generation of energy production. So, as we all know, today humanity cannot imagine their lives without electricity, especially when it comes to the internet, transport vehicles, lighting and heating our houses, as well as fuel supply for technologies that help us to explore our vast world. So, and the question is, where does the electricity come from? And humanity uses different types of sources of energy. For example, nuclear power plants, wind energy, solar panels, and of course, fossil fuels. But all these sources of energy have their big disadvantages. For example, nuclear power plants can cause natural disasters, 
wind energy highly depend on weather conditions, solar panels highly depend on season type. For example, we cannot produce the same amount of energy in winter that we can produce in summer. And of course, fossil fuels pollute our atmosphere with greenhouse gas that cause global warming and acid rains. And today I want to introduce new, highly uh, new, fast developing technology for clean and efficient energy named hydrogen energy. So why hydrogen energy is good source of energy? Well, first, it is the most common element in our universe and it composes the bulk mass of the stars and interstellar gas. And although it does not occur on our planet in its pure form, the main source of hydrogen on our planet is the water of hydrosphere. So it's rivers, oceans, seas, lakes. So, how do we produce hydrogen? The most efficient and clean way is breaking down water in, into oxygen and hydrogen under the electric current. So, uh, the main idea is to create a so-called water, uh, water hydrogen producing cycle. So, what does it mean? So, we can produce hydrogen from water and react, uh, reaction of hydrogen with oxygen also creates water and energy that we can use for our needs. And this uh, water that we will produce, we can use again to produce more hydrogen. So, creating this type of technology, uh, we will be able to create an internal flow of energy for all our planet. So, my next point is uh, how do we store and transport hydrogen? We can store hydrogen in three forms. It is gaseous form, liquefied form and solid form. To store hydrogen in a gaseous form, we will need to use aluminum cylinders and store it under the high pressure. And of course, we, we can transfer gaseous hydrogen under the, in the pipelines, how we use for natural gas. To store hydrogen in, uh, in liquefied form, we'll need to use liquid tanks and store it under the very low pressure and low temperatures. And the third way is to store hydrogen in solid form, we will need to produce a so-called hydrate. Hydrate is a compound of hydrogen and other metal, and this reaction can be produced under the very high pressure. And actually, storing hydrogen in a solid form is the most effective way, because the volume of hydrogen that we can transport in a solid form is much more bigger than, than we can transport hydrogen in a gaseous or liquefied form. So, and how do we produce energy from hydrogen? Of course, we can just burn hydrogen in oxygen and this will create a huge amount of energy and harmless water vapor. But scientists look forward to create, uh, to use hydrogen in the so-called fuel cells. So, fuel cells, unlike batteries and accumulators that we are used to, do not need to be recharged and start their work, their work immediately after the fuel supply. So, as we can see on this slide, a hydrogen fuel cell consists of two electrodes, cathode and anode, which are immersed in electrolyte. Electrolyte is a substance that conducts electricity well. So, the reaction that occurs on these electrodes is hydrogen donates its electrons to oxygen and this creates water vapor and energy. And so that is why scientists look forward to use hydrogen in fuel cells, because it will be the most effective way to produce energy and it will be safe. So overall, I want to say that I think because of all these advantages, hydrogen is going to be one of the best candidates that will, that will be our future energy source because we can transport it in huge volumes on any distance in a solid form. We can produce a huge amount of energy and this energy will be clean. So that's why 
Hydrogen in future will help us to solve various problems as well as problems with pollution and devastation of our nature. So, I want to say thank you for Limitless Conference volunteers and organizers, Columbia College Library Learning Center that helped me to find sources for my presentation, of course to my mentor Dr. Onkar Baines for helping me, very big help in this presentation, giving me helpful advices, and of course my family, friends, and for all of you for coming on this presentation. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Sara, and I'm from Lahore, Pakistan. So I have a question for you all today. With a raise of hands, can everyone show me if they love their mother? Everyone, right? So just like each one of you, I love my mother too. However, my mother is suffering. She's suffering because she can't breathe. She can't breathe because of air pollution. This is my city. Being a patient of asthma, my mother has difficulty breathing most, most times. She has to wear a mask often. She needs an air purifier to monitor her all the time. This is Beijing. Just like major cities in the world, Beijing is also suffering from air pollution and actually a phenomenon called smog. So the atmospheric pollutants or gases that form smog are released in the air when fuels are burnt. When sunlight and its heat react with these gases and fine particles, in the atmosphere, smog is formed. It is purely caused by air pollution. When fossil fuels are burned, they release nitrogen oxides into the atmosphere, which contribute to the formation of smog. Smog causes serious health uh, and respiratory diseases, including lung cancer and ultimately death. Global warming itself is caused by an excessive use of fossil fuels. So another thing, cause of, yeah, um, uh, of um, air pollution is actually wildfires. So um, human acts of carelessness, such as leaving campfires unattended and negligent discarding of cigarette butts result in wildfire disasters every year. Accidents, deliberate acts of arson, burning of debris, and fireworks also. Also contribute to um, to wildfires. Just like smog, wildfires are actually contributing to the decline in our air quality. So this is actually, I don't know if you guys can see it, but this was actually um, Vancouver. So um, this was a picture of Vancouver during um, the wildfire season, which just happened recently, 2021. So even though we have good air quality in Vancouver, um, we need to realize this, that with time, uh, wildfires are actually declining our air quality. Um, so here we have this graph um, of uh, COVID-19 and how it has improved our air quality in the past three months. So as we can see, there's a, there's a decline in Delhi that has really showed us what just small acts of um, helping um, our community um, with air quality can do. This is actually a picture of Delhi before and during COVID. So you guys can see the results. There's like a lot of difference. And this is my city, Lahore. So um, I think that um, with time, if we actually put in the effort and um, we come up with new um, science, scientific technologies that can help us with um, uh, making our air quality better, that would be great. These are actually some pictures that I took during lockdown. So this is my city, Lahore. And this was actually when my city was its cleanest ever. So what can we do together to help increase, uh, improve our air quality? Riding a bike or walking instead of driving, 
uh, taking a bus or a carpooling, using an electric vehicle, Tesla, uh, turning off lights and appliances when they're not in use, in general, reduce our energy usage in every way we can and avoid buying things that are managed, uh, that, that are manufactured using fossil fuels. There, there are some alternatives that we can use to reduce our fossil fuel usage and that includes solar energy from the sun, geothermal energy from inside, uh, from uh, heat inside the earth, wind energy, biomass from plants, hydropower from flowing water and nuclear fusion power. So before I end my presentation, I would actually like to talk to you guys about nuclear fusion power. So in nuclear fusion power, two or more small nuclei combine to form a single larger nucleus, a neutron and a tremendous amount of energy. Nuclear fusion of hydrogen to form helium occurs naturally in the sun and other stars. It takes place only at extremely high temperatures. One of the biggest reasons why we haven't been able to harness power from fusion is that its energy requirements are unbelievably high. In order to, uh, for nuclear fusion to actually occur, we need a temperature of at least 100,000 degrees Celsius. So nuclear fusion is what produces the energy in our sun and all other stars. Uh, scientists have been working hard for the past 70 years to use this reaction to produce safe and abundant energy that does not produce any polluting gases or harmful radioactive material. Scientists are working hard to make this a reality for humanity. It is the future of energy on our planet and has the potential of ultimately eliminating air pollution in cities everywhere. So this is actually what a nuclear uh, energy reactor looks like. Um, techni technological uh, advancements like these will help my mother breathe and future generations breathe. Thank you. Aloha everyone. <laughs> oh, you are familiar with this. <laughs> so, I'm going to begin with my formation of Hawaii Island. So, how many of you have been visiting the Hawaii? Oh, hi! <laughs> so, which things you watch there? Maybe you visited just for vacation, your holidays, or you might think that I'm going to talk about Hawaii as a honeymoon destination? No? So I'm going to talk about its formation as you can see. So in my presentation, I'm going to discuss about the introduction of the chains of Hawaii Island, its geological processes and the myths, innocent beliefs of the people related to this island. Hawaii Island. Hawaii Island is in the Hawaii state of US and it is located in the Central Pacific Ocean. It covers the area near around 2,400 miles from San Francisco towards the east and 5,400 miles from Manila towards the west. Hawaii is the oldest island of Hawaii near around 5 million years ago. Is it interesting guys? And Oahu 3 million years ago. Then Molokai, 1.5 million, then Moai, 1 million. So just for your knowledge, there is also one newborn island here. You guys want to know the name of this island? Yeah? <laughs> yeah? So it's the Lohi Island. After the Hawaii Island, after maybe million of years ago, you are further generations, maybe sometimes in Columbia College, we'll discuss about the Lohi Island as just I'm doing Hawaii Island. So, this is what we are reading and what I gave you. It's the traditional culture of the Hawaii to present this. And in Hawaii language, it's called Li, as we call it garland. It's the symbol of love, friendship, victory, celebration, honor, prestige, and so on. It's the beauty of the Hawaii Island. How the nature, the beach, the sky looks like. But also with the beauty, it's the volcanic eruption. But it's also add to its beauty. 
So what are the reasons behind the, the chain formation? Can anyone tell how the Hawaii Island was formed? The main purpose of my presentation is to inform that how Hawaii Island was formed. There are basically two processes, hotspot volcanism and tectonic plate movement. Without these processes, we are not able to enjoy the beauty of this island. The Hawaii Island haven't formed if these processes will never happen. So now I'm going to discuss about the hotspot volcanism. So what is hotspot? What do you think about this term hotspot? Is it something like danger or something spotlight or a place with a hot temperature or something when you don't have your internet and you ask your friend give me hotspot. Come on guys. What is hotspot? It's not something like that. So hotspot. Hotspot is present in the mantle and mantle is the third layer of the earth. And hotspot is a region deep within the earth's mantle from which heat rises through the process of convection. And this heat facilitates the melting of rocks. But have you guys ever wondered why these uh, for, uh, islands are in a chain? So it's all about the miracle of the tectonic plate movement. The Hawaii Islands are like this. Hawaii, Molokai, Kauai and Moai. These all are in a sequence. But why? Because of the magic of these plates. We have 15 tectonic plates in the lithosphere. And when these plates collide or subduct or crash with each other, it results in the formation of the island. The hotspot is fixed, but the plates are moving. That's why they are creating an island and island. So here is a video for your knowledge how the Hawaii island was formed. So here is the hotspot. It's fixed. Here is the Pacific plate. It's moving, the tectonic plates. And when hotspot reach to the earth's surface, like lithosphere, it creates cracks, volcano erupt, and just forming an island. So that's the video. But the innocent beliefs of the people, like the traditional beliefs, also give a special touch to the Hawaii island. There are geological processes, but what people believe about this? People believe the formation of island was because there was a fight between two sisters, Pele and Namaka. They both were the goddess of fire. And Pele used his power to seduce her sister's husband. And when Namaka came to know about this fact, she told her mother and her mother told Pele to leave the house. And when Pele left the house, her sister started following and she killed her sister. When she killed her sister, her spirit went to the Hawaii island and it's erupted in a volcano. From that day, people believe whenever there is any, whenever there is any formation of an island or whenever there is any volcanic eruption, it's because these sisters are still fighting. So overall, this all is the formation of the Hawaii island. The power of the nature to create these remarkable things is wonderful. If there is not occurrence of any of these processes, we all are not able to enjoy the beauty of the Hawaii. Moreover, the beliefs of these innocent people also give touch to the Hawaii island. It gives a mysterious and interesting look, like one want to go Hawaii island as me. So this is all about the Hawaii island and aloha everyone once again. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Amande. Today I'm going to present about movies, engagement and representation. So we are going to talk about movies and my main topic will be about that how we get engaged with the movies and the representation in the movies and then there will be a conclusion. So to start, I would like to ask why do we watch movies? Like, why do we watch movies and why do we consume like two hours on a laptop or in a cinema. 
So before researching about this topic, I thought I should ask some of my friends and to know about their views and opinions that why do we watch movies? And most of the common answer that I got from majority of the people that we got we watch movies because uh, we get entertained or you know, movies entertain us. And then I thought I should research more about it because I thought, is it the only reason that's why we watch movies? And then I come to a point that no, that's not just the only thing because there are so many things why we watch movies. And the one thing that I found that we get engaged with the movies. Now we get engaged with the movies, we connect with it and we find ourselves in the movies. How do we find ourselves in the movies? And how do we engage with the movies? So movies help us to engage, how? So this is a scene from the movie Parasite and I thought, I think people should know this movie and mostly because it was most popular in 2019. So when I watched this movie, this is the first scene of the movie. I don't know if people from the back can see this, but this is the first scene from the movie and the person is doing something to kill, using that some kind of machine maybe to kill a stink bug and there's a smoke, a smoke coming from it. And when I watched this scene, the first instant thought that it came in my mind that, oh, this is us. Because I come from the home country where people used to come like that. And the same thing happened. It was so fast that we didn't even get the time to close our windows, you know, all the smoke coming to our home. So this is the same thing. And that's how I engaged with the movie. And when I saw that scene, I was so curious because I was just connect with it at the last till at the end. I was with that movie. I didn't feel bored at all because somehow I connect with, I found myself in the movie. There are so many scenes from the movie, for example, Taxi Driver uh, by Martin and he's one of the finest director and Kota Factory, that is Indian web series. When I watch these kind of movies, I just found we, I think, I don't know our people, but I found myself. I found that how I connect with it because in Kota Factory, Kota Factory is all about uh, students student journey and when I complete my high school I was most into like very emotional at that time to you know leave that place or leave that people but when I watch Kota Factory I was into that world again I was be that student and be in that world where I can see that how I used to prepare for the competitive exams and all these things as I'm talking a lot about that you know movies we find ourselves in the movies but there's some people who cannot see themselves in the movies nor they present as a, a villain or some kind of stereotypes. Why it happens, you know, there comes a point about representation, that why it's important. According to Lauren Washington, it's an author of The Importance of Representation in Films and Movies, he said that representation is important to tell the story from both sides. Why representation is important, you know? Everyone has a different story. Everyone has a different story and every people have a different viewpoints. Every people have different experience in their lives. So if we are not going to present or give a space to the people who have their own ideas, have their own stories, how the stories can be become more diverse, how stories been, become more diverse. I think we need more space for the people. That's why representation is important to tell the stories from both the sides. Moreover, in one of the interview, uh, Spike Lee, He's one of the uh, finest director, American directors. He said that he mostly made a movies because he wanted to show his culture, his representation, or the people that uh, the people, uh, black African people that experience in their lives. They wanted to present it. And same, similarly, in my country, India, there are people who coming from a lower community, which is called Dalits. And one of the director that he mostly make a movies about him, his name is Nagraj Manjule. And he said that when I watch movie, I don't see myself. I ask one question about where am I? You know, where is, where am I? When I watch movie, where am I? Why he said that where am I? Because when we see a movie or any kind of a story, he feel left out, you know, it's the story about not him, it's story about the people who are represented as from upper caste or from another or who have the representation, not the people we come from. So that's the question he asked. Why stories are important? Why representation important? Because stories are important. We are grow up in a society where stories play a very integral part in our life. From a childhood, when we grow up, 
uh, when we grow up, we see that people, our parents recite a story to us, and then you now if we late from our work or from our school, we make a story that what we gonna tell to our uh, teachers or professors. Stories become an important part. So stories do not connect until unless we do not find ourselves in the movies. So there is at the end, I would like to say that do movies change us? I think the question should not be about do movies change us, but movies somehow impact us. Movies impact us and it, you know, it grab our attentions and questions our beliefs. Thank you. Hi everyone, very good morning to all. Uh, today I want to present my research about the prevention of genocide in India. Like how can Geneva Convention to stop the BGP from committing genocide? So first of all, I can say that from my research, like uh, Hindu nationalism is consider, uh, considered as the one of the specific reason for the anti-Muslim racism in India. Because like uh, Hindu nationalism started many years ago, most of the political parties uh, like the Hinsum Raj, BJP and the most of political leaders like Indra Gandhi, Rahul Gandhi and they are belong to the Hindu community and they want to form their Hindu Dutta and promote their Hindu Dutta through their part. Uh, and this Hindu nationalism is based on the political, economic and the social factors and they can be, con it's, uh, all of the factors can be controlled by the political leaders. So, first of all like the genocide, genocide is considered as the any type of mental and the physical torture in our society considered as the genocide. So Hindu nationalism and the anti-Muslim racism in India. There are so many factors we can consider as the genocide, like common fact factors we can say that uh, Muslim community and the Hindu community both have a different caste, different religion and a different life of standards. But, uh, but according to my research said that like the Mr. Narendra Modi who is a current leader of the, who is a current Prime Minister of the India, uh, according to it like hate speech, polarization and the unequal status given to the Muslim community are the three main factors that create the genocide against the Muslim community. There are, uh, there are two stages. There are two like stages can be considered as the genocides that I will be uh, that I will be like point out in the further slides. So first of all, I can talk about the liberalism. Liberalism is always to talk about liberty and the human rights. With the help of liberalism, India signed the Geneva Convention in 1950. So the Geneva Convention focuses on the four main things like the boundary and six soldiers and the pr uh, prisoners of the war, protection of the war and protection of civilian persons in the time of war. So it's talk about the soldiers protections and talk about the, the tools that we are using in the uh, fights or any war. So I think everyone is thinking that if the Geneva Convention is talk about the soldiers or the tools that are using in the war, so how it can be helped with the Muslims that are like the racism that is occurring in India? So that is the question that everyone is thinking about that. So my further slides will answer that. So there are two stages that is a polarization and the preparation that is occur in India. So in the stage of polarization, I said that Hindu nationalism tries to provoke the Hindu community. Like for example, uh, like cow is considered as the goat for the Hindu community and the Hindu nationalists considered the, these eating meat into the polarization because and create a diverse issue for the Hindu believers because the Muslim people like to eat the non-veg non food so it is con uh, and Hindu nationalism considered this a very polarizing stage because cow is considered as the goat for the Hindu community and in the 2014 as I mentioned, like BJP parties came into the power, they just stole the cows from the Muslim community and gave, to the, uh, gave them to the Hindu community because according to them, Muslim people kill their cows in order to feel the Hindu community down. So it is called like mental torture, which is called genocide. And the, and the stage of preparation when government gave the physical power to the military and the police officers in order to create, in order to against the physical violence against the Muslim community. In 2020, 23 years old Muslim man, like the boy, he was bitten by the police officer because he did not sing the national anthem. So, there is a real, a real event that has happened in Jammu and Kashmir, as you already know. So, in the article 370, 
uh, Jammu and Kashmir have a special status, but it has been removed by Mr. Narendra Modi, who is the current leader of the India. So, in 2019, when the Mr. Narendra Modi uses the genocide to turn off the internet and lock the Kashmiri leaders into their homes and cut the land lights. So all these, when the like these type of genocides, and when the Kashmiri Muslims try to protect themselves and defend the police officers, the most of Kashmiris were died in that. And this is like the Hindu nationalists consist these type of protection is called uh, as a terrorist because they think that the the like the Kashmiri Muslims try to protect themselves and they uses their uh, uses their tools. So they said that they are a terrorist because they try to beat the police officers. So it is called the eighth stage. There are ten stages in the genocides, but in the Jammu and Kashmir, it's the eighth stage that is occurred. So that is the answer that I asked earlier. Like how we can prevent with the Geneva Convention. So Red Cross groups, as we already know. Uh, it has a special position under the Geneva Convention. It's uh, like it is a completely neutral and independent organization and committee. As I am from India and most of students are also from India, they everyone know that Red Cross group and Red Cross Day is celebrated in every education institutions. Most of the teachers, like I can suggest that, like teachers can provide the explanations and uh, organize the campaigns which can help to explain the. Uh, how the Red Cross groups can be formed? What are the reason behind that? So these type of explanation can help the children's to awareness to create the awareness among this racism. So this type of racism can be only solved with the children because children are our the uh, our futures and they have ability to change the world. So as like. Red Cross committee serves the people without discrimination and same the Hindu children stop the genocide against Muslim and they build a racial free nation. If like, uh, however, if we talk about the common peoples, because children are the on the one side and the common people are on the another side. If we talk about the common people, so they can be encouraged with the help of Red Cross group members, because Red Group uh, group members can organize a organization and camps. They where he can provide or they can provide a uh, information about the Red Cross groups that how they pro how they help the people without any discrimination. They don't think that uh, he is a Muslim, he is a sex, or he is a uh, like uh, Hindu, so they just provide their health service without any discrimination. So, as the Nurani said, also the humanitarian body, such as international committee, the Red Cross may be offered service to the parties of the conflict. So, in the end, I want to say that these type of uh, like the common people and the, if the common people and uh, our the society and our children can be motivated so it directly affect to our government because every leader wants the power and support from the government to develop their uh, develop their power at the national level if three are the motivated so our uh, like india country become a racial free in the future so as a and i can say that our geneva convention is our the prevented tool and uh, red cross is our the specific effective uh, like divided into the tool and campaign and organization are the main concerns thank you so much and most of the thank to my instructor Aden and sara thank you so first of all a very warm welcome to all the instructors guests and my fellow students i feel very privileged to be a part of it and presents my thoughts so let's begin so february 24 2022 it's just like a recent date not been many days so i think so you would have get the idea that my presentation is on a very recent topic and it's on russia ukraine war February 24, 2022 is the official date when Russia started invading Ukraine. And to be precise, it's been 25 days the invasion has started and is still going on. Civilians are leaving their home, their part of their being, their belongings and everything and seeking to other countries to escape. And we and the common people like us, we are just getting bombarded by the images of Ukrainians on the social media and getting panicked by it. Let me show you some images that you all would be familiar with. Okay. Oh. 
so i think so you all would be familiar with some images of this white ukrainians these families these toddlers being holded by the soldiers and just getting panicked by it but let me show you some other images that you would not be familiar with how many of you have seen these images the images of fru ukrainians the images of indian students at the border seldom do we do see these images because for the western media these images are criminals free loaders or the invaders of their country that's why their entry is being denied at the pol at the poland border by the polish authorities and both of the groups are being the victim of invasion by the russia yet one is receiving a very warm welcome by the poland and the other abandonment so as everything is happening around the border so let me question you like what is a border when i remember very vividly when i was in 9th standard my teacher just i was just like cramming border are the marked territory of a country so there would be a fixed line this is your country and this is my country but is that all is a line describing that this is uh, uh, this is the differentiation of a country However that's not all borders are much more than that as one of my favorite writer Harsha Walia she's a south asian activist and she lives here in vancouver she suggests that borders are not fixed line or passive objects border are the project, uh, productive regime generated by the racialized social religion further imbued by gender nationality age gender sex and many more things so there are many strategies of the border imperialism that the uh, that's how the border functions and they work so one of the strategies that i have focused in my research paper is the discursive control which entails how the government creates the order of migrants and determine their legitimacy by creating whiteness as a uh, as a standard of personhood right to seek asylum which is a basic right of every human being according to universal declaration of human rights right to seek asylum uh, any person whose life is in danger in their own country has a right to seek asylum in another in another country poland is a signatory of geneva uh, geneva convention yet unquestionably denying it as the entry is being determined by your skin color if you are black you are allowed you are not allowed to enter if you are uh, if you are white you are welcome with very open hands like is it fair like your skin color is being your skin color is being determined to getting the entry into it so my uh, and it's just like a trigger warning my next slide may contains um, contains some content which might be sensitive to other you may close your eyes or turn off your head whichever is convenient to you okay so these are the images of some toddlers lying in the sea like is it these uh, images are a symbol of refugee crisis at a refu refugee crisis at the border we may swallow the images of i think so youth but what about the toddlers As, uh, keeping aside the russia ukraine war what about the mig what about the migrants and the immigrants at the other countries what about the undocumented people who are being named as illegals and have been treated so indiscriminately each in each and every country so i think so the covid-19 pandemic covid-19 pandemic and the invasion of ukraine by the russia has shown the moral hypocrisy of western nations and how they discriminate against the black and brown black and brown migrants the ethnocentric prejudice that not only devalues the life of the black and brown communities but also their universal right to seek asylum so to wrap up my uh, to wrap up my presentation i would like to imagine about a post pandemic world where every individual is treated fairly irrespective of what their color is what their gender is what their age is or what their sex is 
every individual has a right to the basic right of every human being and to end my presentation i would like to end my presentation by a beautiful poem a uh, home by watson shire no one leaves home unless home chases you by the hot blood in your belly and even then you carried the national anthem under your breath tearing up your passport in the airport in the airports and sobbing each mouthful of paper that you would not be going back and no one put their children in the boat unless the sea is safer than the land thank you so much So good afternoon everyone my name is Japleen Singh and today I'm going to present my startup idea Refurbra so Refurbra is changing the way people dispose their old stuff so first of all i would say what is refurbra refurbra is basically a platform where people can just come and give away their unwanted things that they don't need so the things come i just want to ask you all some questions have you ever thought of where your old stuff goes or uh, like how it affects your surrounding so the answer is this As you can see here is your old stuff goes whatever you throw in the garbage cans whatever the old stuff just uh, you, you just kept out of uh, outside of your house this image you can see this is from my neighborhood last week uh, this is a unwanted stuff that that she don't need she just kept outside his home and this is totally illegal in in british columbia to put stuff like this but most of people do these things to save their valuable time and money but uh, but i would uh, ask you all is this the right solution for this according to me no so uh, this uh, this was the thing that happens to your old stuff so uh, first of all i would discuss the problem that is currently in the market so the problem is that disposing old stuff like furniture sofa wooden table junk appliances any big stuff that you have in your home like disposing it is very very difficult for you uh, it can uh, it can include any uh, it can it can include any wooden a uh, wooden table desk any big stuff because small stuffs are easy to dispose but uh, what what were the household things that we do and for uh, to dispose this all things you need to uh, you need to give away your two most valuable time the two most valuable things first is time and money first of all if i talk about time to, uh, according to me time uh, according to me time cannot be major but what about the money the uh, you need to spend from $50 to $1000 according to the weight you have you, uh, according to a customer you need to uh, you need to waste of two these two of most important things that you have and uh, uh, and if i would say uh, 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 along with that i would say we have uh, the, uh, 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 according to me i would say uh, according to me according to me i would say as a consumer you have seen your time and money but what about the environment because of this garbage you are you, you are not polluting uh, you are not polluting your earth but, uh, but because of this there are there are lot of landfills that is increasing every year uh, the because of landfills uh, because of land with there uh, because of land with there are lot of hazards smoke a uh, uh, second point is uh, the air pollution water pollution uh, 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 along with that water contamination and at the end i would say uh, i would say uh, i would say it is affecting your whole uh, it is affecting it is affecting our whole ecosystem because of this old junk so what is solution solution is refurbra refurbra is a platform where you can just come uh, where you can just come and uh, where you can just come and give away your old stuff whatever you have you uh, are through your mobile app you can just come to refurbra and, and you can give away uh, any any stuff you have the process is divided into five parts first of all you need to download the refurbra mobile application after first uh, afterwards you need to select the type of product you have uh, 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 the type of product you have Uh, along with that the third thing is to upload the photos photos of the product uh, 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 as well as the, the fourth thing uh, fourth thing you need to wait for the approval and select the time slot uh, select the time slot whenever you are available and the fifth thing and the last step is uh, the last step is a refurbra team will come and pick up your old stuff whatever you have so the so the process was the process was uh, the process was very very easy within five steps you can dispose your old stuff whatever you have but the main thing is the, the main thing is that why you should choose us the, there are a lot of the, there are a lot of businesses like just junk uh, just junk 1800 junk but uh, the main thing to choose us is it is totally free i am saying you need to uh, you don't need to spend any single penny to dispose your old stuff the and the uh, uh, and according uh, uh, 
as well as uh, 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 along with that the pickup will be within 24 hours and the second and the most important thing is that we will not uh, 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 the second and the most important thing is that we will not able to throw uh, uh, the throw your all junk to the landfills we will be saving the environment but we will not going to put into land save landfills and uh, uh, and if you want to know more about my startup, uh, the right now I'm uh, right now I'm at my uh, right now I'm at my uh, at my ideation stage. Uh, 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 you, uh, you can reach me through my email. Thank you so much, and do not has, uh, do not hesitate to add uh, to ask any type of questions you have. Thank you. guys thanks for all of you guys being here and also thanks for all of the online students who's participating in this like section so uh, my name is Loris and today I'm gonna talk about a pretty fascinating thing called fractal and how it could be connected with AI first what is fractal so um, basically these all of these pictures they are fractals so basically fractals are the things uh, self repeating itself over and over again so it's basically a geometric object that is similar to itself on all scales. So um, this is one of my favorites co called Coke Snowflake. Um, basically you just put two triangles upside down and put it over and over again to the uh, snowflake term. So you can see like it just keeps zooming in. And um, basically this is like a finite area but the infinite diameters. So I would rather call it um, um, an infinite loop. So, okay, I don't know if you guys can see the picture here, but um, like, um, I just want to ask you guys which uh, apple is different from others? Can anyone answer this question? Yep, go ahead. Bottom left? You think it's this one? Um, yeah, probably like you guys can't really see the picture. Actually, it's this one. This is again. The others, they are orange. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the next one, <laughs> the next one, just imagine that. So close your eyes, take a deep breath, and imagine you're flying in the sky and you got, uh, uh, let's say, red wings, and uh, you're flying over mountain and mountain. So I think you guys can have this picture on your mind. Then what makes you think? Like the first, uh, the, fir the previous uh, picture, First, and then you think. For this one, you don't really see the picture, but you can still think. So, how what makes us think? Of course, consciousness. But what is consciousness? Like, is consciousness something in our mind that we can touch? Actually, no, right? Um, this is my hypothesis. I think consciousness itself is a fractal. So it can prove, it can zoom in over and over again. And like us, we can pick a lot of different signals from all sides and this So uh, here's one of my, um, Jason Patrick, he's a um, really famous math mathematician. And um, like in 2002, I guess that could be a sunny day, um, he went to a bar and he hit his head uh, accidentally. Then when he, uh, everything in his uh, mind or everything he can see uh, are fractals. So everything, like when, if I were right now, all of you guys are fractals in front of me. Like I couldn't say, but you guys can keep zooming in. So. Um, I guess this could be like when he hit his head, something probably like um, some it kind of like press some magical button to, uh, connect with the consciousness in his mind, which makes him think, uh, make him see the fractals. So this is a brain, basically. It could be my brain. It could be your brain. So and uh, these are the neurons. See picture. See the. They are all the same thing, but just different scales. Like if you think it's similar to itself, it's basically a lot of scientists think the neurons are fractals too, right? So this is also proofs, like um, because the neurons are the fractals, our brain looks like a fractal too. Probably our consciousness inside of the brain is fractal too. So which leads us to the most important today, robot and human. So what makes us different with the robot? So what makes 
make robots instead of, instead of they make us because we can think and they can't. Um, some people may think, oh, robots can think too, because um, like uh, there are some like uh, humanoid robots, for example, the Sophia uh, from the United States. But I so I think because she only got a really large database, so she can actually analyze from your tone and uh, your um, like your sentence to give you a really good ex response. But it doesn't mean that she can think. Put the to conscious through it to the robot's mind, make it. Then it could be a really good improvement or a pretty, like um, good development on AI field, but not for humans, because if the robot can think, they have uh, like initial of better than us. But what if they can think stuff? Then they can become smarter than us. So what if they really control the world, like the the movies, right? I guess my like. This one because it's in yellow color. So basically, it's like, well, wait a minute. Or guys, I can't say the word here. Yeah. So this is the question for you guys. Like, well, it really take over the world um, because if fractal consciousness really can insert to uh, the robot's mind. So this is what we need to be aware about. What if some things happened, like the development? Thing, like the bad result. And um, that's it. Thank you for all of you guys. <laughs>
uh, helps a student compare a special, uh, special relationship and use logic and reasoning to explore and create connection. Uh, also, we apply various strategies to take part in problem solving uh, that are related to a story and uh, a story and the place of the indigenous people would be very fun activity in the class. And the next slide is about the waving. Uh, waving is a skill and an art that has been used throughout the history in many cultures. Uh, I guess uh, it is the oldest common artistic view that we can see in the most of the cultures, even in the Eastern Asia or Middle East, and here also in uh, North America. Uh, there are several possible math mathematic curriculum connection with waving in different levels. Uh, that these are the concepts for grade six. We can talk about the line graphs. Uh, for grade 7 and 8, we can discrete linear relation using expression, tables, and graphs. In grade 9, we can talk about two variable uh, linear relations. In grade 11, also a student can learn about linear relationships and a slope as a rate of the change. And as you can see, for example, here in this uh, picture that is from the Desmos website, um, here is the some student works that is waving works that a student can talk about the slope concept. Uh, the next one is about bottom blankets. The lesson will uh, start by discussing the significance of bottom blankets in an Aboriginal culture. And there are different tree design elements, and it's better to be uh, to say alphabets uh, for creating this special and beautiful. Uh, design together, such as the uh, avoid form, uh, U form, and a split U form, and also S form. And uh, they uh, they use this alphabets to make uh, beautiful designs, such as this picture uh, on the. I think there's a mistake. Such as this picture. And if you are interested to making something like that, I printed uh, some alphabets here. Uh, you can come to me after my presentation and take one and just cut, with, uh, cut them and paste it under another paper to make beautiful design, if you like. And uh, here is some concept that we can talk about it uh, uh, with the bottom blankets and these alphabets. We can talk about the patterns. Uh, create, identify, and describe non-number and uh, number pattern, convert pattern from one model to another using a manipulative calculator, spoken diagrams, and written the symbols, describe the rule for a pattern, and make prediction based on models and objects, and also about the shape and space, uh, compare, sort, contrast, and classify 2D shapes, and make identical and uh, congruent 2D, 2D shapes, a rearrange and uh, contract a sketch with using a set of 2D shapes and make imaginary shape and symmetrical 2D shapes using reflection and folds. And uh, in conclusion, uh, I have to say uh, with using all these techniques, uh, we can keep ind indigenous culture alive and uh, make more connection between the uh, Canadian mathematics cir curriculum and this culture. In addition, this connection can provide more fun class environment uh, by doing activities like waving. And the activities help a student to easily remember the concept with their practical usage and make a student creative. Uh, lastly, I have to mention uh, that this uh, masterpiece is by Norval uh, Mauricio, who's awarded the uh, Order of Canada. And uh, thank you for your attention. struggling. My heart is sinking. I am feeling I am failing. I feel like I am failing. Weren't you all having the same thoughts during the lockdown? I certainly had. Good afternoon. I am Shwati Arora, a simple small town girl who loves to write and express the feelings in the form of poetry writing. Now, this is not my occupation, 
but my passion which does not really pay my bills but it definitely helps me to vent out all the pressure building inside me because it's very difficult to communicate with people sometimes it is difficult especially for people like me since i'm an introvert so this piece of this piece of poetry helps me to express my feelings to narrate my feelings to the entire world and during this pandemic it was it it went it was really difficult for me and since this is the piece of poetry that i wrote which would uh, like which would express my feelings to you so the topic of my poem is a better post pandemic world one fine day watching tv at home and what did i hear the covid has spread from china to rome now this news was no less than a nightmare separation from loved ones no one could bear negativity bundled up in my head how one will earn butter and bread masks sanitizers lockdowns and quarantine no one knew what would be the next scene but i decided to use this lockdown as a look down time and i had to make lemonade when life gave me lime travel hindered and all the vehicles parked inside travel hindered and all the vehicles parked inside but what did i see that the nature went on a cleansing ride online work and online education online work and online education families became close and it refined the offline relation people introspected and tried new stuff people introspected and tried new stuff for some it was a blessing and for some it was even rough everything in life is all about our outlook whether positive or negative we all write our own book this pandemic taught us an important thing this pandemic taught us an important thing that this life is a big roller coaster swing hope love and patience is all we require hope love and patience is all we require to make our lives a masterpiece and not a satire to make our lives a masterpiece and not a satire this poem reflects our life which is completely uncertain and it is really important to live the life as it comes because we have in the the best way to live the life uh, according to me is to accept the unacceptable and if we learn to accept what is coming and what is what god is giving us we can live our life happily at the end i would just like to say be thankful for what you have you'll end up having more be thankful for what you have you'll end up having more but if you'll concentrate on what you don't have but if you'll concentrate on what you don't have you'll never ever have enough you'll never ever have enough thank you so much hello and good afternoon everyone my friend roman hello and i asa we were very curious about ambition and contentment and happiness and we wanted to understand the relationship the um, divergence and the extremity of these according to our most fa uh, favorite source the google dictionary box ambition refers to a strong desire to do or to achieve something typically requiring determination and hard work another definition given was the desire and determination to achieve success whereas contentment was just a state of happiness and satisfaction when we um tried searching happiness the word happiness uh we came up with a very lazy definition it was the state of being happy <laughs> with that as an introduction we would like you to um have a look at a video that we had uh, shot during our college hours and um we had taken some interviews uh with some students at the at columbia college we recommend you to try and uh, come up with your own replies to the questions in the video what is your ultimate motive for chasing what you desire um 
my ambition is to actually be a writer, but at the same time is to be an engineer. Um, my ambition is to become a civil engineer. <laughs> main goal is to become an athlete. I'm a boxer, a professional boxer, well-known and um, well-recognized in the society. Um, I would say my ambition is to be able to work in at work and contribute in, so, um, in social work, uh, especially f um, for women rights. Yeah, definitely, that's everyone's desire. Oh yeah, sure, um, because, you know, it's gonna give me this kind of fulfillment like I've done um like what I'm fulfill like what I'm meant for. Yeah, I'd feel very happy. Yeah. Oh definitely, yeah. Definitely sad. So if I don't achieve my ambition, um I feel life must always go on. Um I keep pushing in whatever field I find myself in future. Well, if I need to achieve my ambition, well, I would feel bad, but I wouldn't, like, I wouldn't give up, I guess. Well, I feel very disappointed in myself. I don't have a plan B. The moment you have a plan B, it means you're not certain of plan A, which is kind of equivocal. Um, to work as a normal citizen of Canada. <laughs> Well, plan B, well, I could get a job in like something, um, you know, something related or something even completely different, maybe in business, yeah, and yeah, I'll do something there, you know. Uh, at the moment, I don't really have a plan B. I mean, if it's a plan, I mean, I would say if I plan A, that I'm going to fight for women's rights, and plan B, if I don't get into that position or the job, I guess, any kind of social work to contribute to society would be uh, satisfying for me, yeah. No, I won't, because my ambition is my dream, and my dream is my goal. First of all, I'm going to achieve my ambition, that's sure, but uh, if I don't, uh, because I stick with my plan B, I will still be happy. Uh, no, I will not be happy. Yes, 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 because in the end, the uh, the whole issue of like living is to be happy right you know you have to find happiness in the end now those are some pretty good responses that we had received from our fellow classmates and students um and as far as we've gathered we found that um most of them would obviously um they understood that uh if they achieved their ambition they would be happy and if they didn't, they would be sad, but they'd move on eventually. And that's, that's quite simple and that's good because we like simple. <laughs> so, um, we believe that just the right amount of ambition amalgamated with uh, contentment is the true secret to success. And happiness, of course. <laughs> Both are the components of this broad term, and happiness relies on a dynamic balance between these two. Ambition gives us hope and resilience, whereas contentment it brings us to the present. It's a grounding force. We need to consistently try to achieve our dreams while being content in our efforts. And life is a journey; it's not a destination. And but we still need to decide on a vision, right? The problem arises when people stick to their ambition till it becomes an obsession. However, here over ambition or being extremely ambitious until uh, being extremely ambitious sets the foundation to sure shot destruction. For example, ideological warfare. People have so many constra uh, constraining expectations and conditions attached to their desires that their um, ambitions lead them far astray from their happiness. They try to achieve success by any means possible and when they fail, it's the end of the world for them. It seems contrary to the generally glorifying perspective we have of ambitious people. Usually they are considered the leaders, the alphas, the game changers in our world. The same goes for overly content people. They renounce the world, or they don't try at all.
perhaps due to their fear of failure. They come, uh, they give up too quickly. And yet again, uh, yet again, that's far from happiness, right? Nevertheless, coming back to happiness, we, I would like to say that happiness does not depend on anything. It is free. And, uh, and it, it is, it just happens without any reason. And it's not dependent on any kind of give and take. It does not owe to your ambitions or to your successes or failures. Thus, towards the end, a simple formula for happiness and ambition is very well quoted by a Chinese philosopher, Lao Tzu, who says, be content with what you have. Rejoice in the way things are. When you realize that there is nothing lacking, the whole world belongs to you. And that's it. We need to move from a lack mentality to a one of abundance. And that's the way to brighter futures. Look at us. We have tried very hard for Limitless and we do hope to win. Nonetheless, we enjoyed every part of the journey and are content with how far we have come. And we are very happy to be presenting in front of you. Thank you for being such a great audience. Uh, good afternoon everyone, my name is Zedric Pasquale and I'm here today to share with you a short film that I made for my communications class last semester. So the film was a small protest to a deci decision that was ongoing at my country, the Philippines at the time. Uh, that decision being to keep online classes mandatory and keeping it, making it a standard for the, con to the country going forward. People in high government positions even considering this decision was very problematic for me as it shows how out of touch they were with everyone's situation during the pandemic. Considering the fact that a lot of students from low income families had had a hard time uh, integrating to online classes, fortunately now that decision doesn't really have any legs to stand on and some universities, uh, universities in the Philippines have even started opening up for face-to-face -face classes. Fortunately for us as well here in Columbia College, we were able to do the same thing much, much earlier. <laughs> and <clears throat> lastly, as students who has gone through online classes, I'm sure there's a lot of complaints that we, we had during those times, like, oh, I'm not learning anything, oh, this is boring, oh, I miss my friends, and these kind of complaints have affected how people viewed face-to-face -face classes and saying that, well, if that, those are all the complaints, then we can just keep face-to-face -face classes ongoing. But hopefully my film can show you that there is a totally different side of that spectrum, that there is a real ongoing issue for keeping it ongoing, especially in low-income countries or third-world countries like the Philippines. So, enjoy the film. Uh, there is a short segment there where I, it's in Tagalog, so Hopefully you can read the subtitles from there. Thank you. Good morning, Menaka. Good morning, Frank. What's my schedule for today? You have three classes today. Biology at 8 a.m., Philosophy at 12 p.m., and Communications at 4 p.m. You also have a scheduled Zoom meeting with your groupmates at 3 p.m. for your final project. Another full day. Lights at 50%. Hi, Frank. Long breakfast and coffee. Done. Anything else?
Ma? Ma? Hello? Shit, 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 shit. Hello, Ma? May internet tayo? Anak, wala ata. Pakicheck nga sa router. <sighs> wala ulit, Ma. I have class today. Sa aparador ko, may barya. Kumuha ka muna. Hindi, kailangan din natin kumain kahit pa paano ma. Eh, paano yan? Kailangan mo matapos semester mo para graduate. It's okay. I'll make it work. Frame, music. Ça fait qu'un an que je te fais l'amour, tu me regardes toujours pas. Je te tourne autant, tourne autant, mais tu ne me vois pas. Je parle pourtant la même langue, je la défends à tour de bras. De Tokyo à Portland, en passant par Barcelona. Je fais des efforts, j'explique bien, je suis sûrement inadapté. Quand je m'exporte, j'explique rien, j'ai pas besoin de m'expliquer. C'est peut-être la Tu te poses beaucoup de questions Ou peut-être, peut-être pas assez Et c'est moi qui suis vraiment con Je t'aime encore, je t'aime encore, je t'aime encore Je t'aime encore, je t'aime encore Zed, okay ka lang ba? Napansin ko ang dami mo ng absent sa Alam ko mahirap na panahon ngayon Kaya tinatry ko kayo tulungan sa grades Pero wala na ako ibang magawa eh Zed, anak, pasensya na. Ginawa ko na lahat na makakaya ko pero kailangan mo umulit na semester.